Um, okay, Sam, Sam sees a cat. <laughs> go to the three little dots over her picture in the corner, you know, and then one of the things says spotlight for everyone. Okay. Let me see if I can make um that worked. <laughs> I'm gonna make you the host, Carrie. So you get to watch the room. Okay. Okay. All right, now that we now that we've finished the uh, background, welcome uh, everybody. I'd like to introduce Dr. Bridget Landry, and who's uh, been work. She's from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She's worked on robotic space missions for over thirty years, including the Hubble Space Telescope, the Mars Pathfinder the Cassini mission to Saturn and the Curiosity Yay. rover. That's the top 10 list of NASA, I think. Yeah. <laughs> In addition, she's been attending and working cons since she was 13. And I can tell she is a master level yeah. costumer with a wicked sense of humor is what this says. <laughs> I think I can tell. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna start with some questions about um women in science i am also a woman in science um so i've been there um and i was going through college in the 70s so i don't really want to give my age away but that gives you an idea so as a woman in the sciences what's been your particularly biggest challenges that is an interesting question um Part of it is having to suss out the, um, the culture of every mission. I've been at the lab for 30 years, but I've been on different projects and each project has a different character, different culture. And uh, so there are times when you have to dress a certain way to be taken seriously. And sometimes that means business suit. And sometimes that means jeans and a t-shirt. And if you wear the wrong one, you can be not mm -hmm. dismissed, but it makes your work harder. So um, oh, I know what you're saying about that. <laughs> so um, and I, I have to say that as as a woman, I was taught to defer and to um, qualify things. And I remember reading. Um, you just don't understand uh, about communication between men and women. And up to that point, I had assumed that I was very masculine in my presentation and I was blown away to realize that I had very feminine uh, speech patterns and uh, deferral. And so I started with my emails and I write the email and then I go back and take out all the qualifiers all the I thinks or it might be or whatever, as many of them as I could and started there. And then I started doing that in my verbal speech to try to take more room at the table. Yeah, I, I, can't, I, I know what you mean. I wish I'd run across that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know how I got interested in the sciences and I remember watching a Bell Telephone video on the sun. I knew I was gonna be an astronomer and I'm a chemist. And, and I don't know what it was about the big guy in the white, in the white lab coat that probably never saw the inside of a lab, <laughs> but that got me going. How did you decide to go in the sciences? Was there something in your childhood that sent you in that direction? Absolutely. Um, it was a combination of two things. Um, I started, you know, I, coming of age in the, uh, in the seventies. And so I saw Star Trek on one channel mm -hmm. and the moon landings on the other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I understood the combination or the, the, the connection between those two and how starting with one, we would get to the other. And that's when it all gelled for me. That's, I, I knew where I wanted to go and I never looked back. Did you have a telescope or chemistry shed or other scientific learning media? I am not calling them toys <laughs> when you were growing up. No, because I was the girl. 
<laughs> my dad my, got me a telescope. I was shocked. <laughs> I was I was child number seven, so um, oh. I I was just kind of lost in the shuffle. I did manage to steal some of my brother's uh, Tinker Toys and uh, and Legos and such, but um, I was never given them because, well, it's your girl. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, you have a you you have had a lot of projects. What's been your favorite so far? Oh, uh, Pathfinder, hands down. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about why you like that? Um, part of it was where I was in my career at the time. Um, I had worked on Hubble at that point. I had worked on Topex and I got on Pathfinder and it was kind of a seminal moment for me because I, they had a very interesting process. It was a very, very small team. And so they would hire somebody who had the skills for some of what they needed to do. And you had to kind of carve out your piece. And then they'd look at the hole that was left and find somebody to fit that hole. And that was just at the end of my comfort zone. That was, that was really hard for me. I'm very linear. I, I want to know what the job is, what the rules are, so that I know I'm doing it right. And so it was a real challenge for me. And to make that step up and be able to do that um, was very, uh, it, it made me grow in ways that I hadn't before. And the other thing is, again, very, very small team. So I was a much bigger cog in this machine. Um, I've never been on a mission that small again. And so um, it, it was twofold. I had a lot more responsibility. I had a lot more sense of efficacy because I had a real sense of what my, you know, what I was doing that nobody else on the mission was doing. And the other thing was um, because it was a very simple project, I was able to delve down into the underbelly of some of the, of the software. And that served me very well in later missions because every time you add complexity to a mission, you usually add GUIs or, or scripts or whatever, and you get away from the real nuts and bolts of what the software is doing. And so having worked on Pathfinder, I understood those nuts and bolts. And so when it broke, I had a much better idea of where the problem was and where to go looking for it. So um, I had a real um, basic level understanding of the software that somebody coming in later on a more complex mission simply didn't get unless they were the ones doing it and that meant they weren't the ones using it. So I, I had a very um, unique experience on Pathfinder and that has affected all the rest of my missions. That's a really good Good answer. And I that I know how hard it is when you're used to being a linear thinker, which I am too, although I'm kind of I got my creative side. <laughs> you want me to do what? <laughs> you mean I'm in charge of my heart? So uh, I, I, I get it. A marine scientist friend of mine, er, and she encouraged me to do this, but I haven't, earned her PhD from Harvard at the age of 60. Mm. And she always said, it's marine, she did marine science. She always said that we always need to keep a sense of wonder with science. Do you agree with that and why? Absolutely. Or do you disagree? No, I totally agree. That is, uh, that is absolutely true. Part of it is that that facilitates out of the box thinking, which it can be a challenge, but um, the other part is, why would you do something if you weren't enjoying it? I, I'm constantly amazed when I find somebody who works at the lab who's doing it because it fits their skill set and they would be just as happy building toasters. And I, I just, it's like, oh my God, this is my bliss. This is, they actually pay me to do this? <laughs> you know? Um, and, and there are a lot of people at the lab that are like that, but um, there are people who, who aren't, that they're, this is their job and they do it very well and they like it, but it's not in their hearts. 
And I just can't imagine spending that much time, that much portion of your life doing something that isn't feeding your heart. Every time I see the pictures from Mars and the rover yeah. and the helicopter, oh my God. I just that's amazing. Yes. And the, the new helicopter that's flying around on Mars. Oh my God. That's that is cool. I mean, we're <laughs> we're cutting edge. I mean, there's it's it's an exciting time. It is, it is. And see, as a kid, I want to do I wanted to do just what you're doing. I think my math skills are not really completely up to it. So I'm very curious. What this kind of is what we're talking about. What's the thing you like best about your job? I, I hmm. That is a, a. I like being valuable. I like the fact that I get a you know I get a call in the middle of the night and I have to come in and help you know say uh, reboot the spacecraft or something. That to me, that's like cool. Um, but it's also um, we're expanding knowledge. We're doing something that's never been done before, and sometimes it drives you insane because <laughs> there is no, you know, you 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 try something and it doesn't work, and so you try something else and that doesn't work, and, it, and it's it's it, in a lot of ways it's like costuming. You're building prototypes. You're inventing things on the fly you're solving problems on the fly it's you you're anticipating you're trying to to figure out what order is the best to do things in it, it's it, it uses so many different parts of your brain and it is so rewarding emotionally like i said every time i see a picture of mars it's just, I mean, Mars is my, my, my favorite, but uh, there are some pictures from, from Cassini. There's pictures from Dawn that are just like, I hope to. <laughs> so I, should I, I ask I'm, you if the next thing you're going to do is go to Mars? <laughs> you know, I applied to the astronaut program uh, many years ago and uh, didn't make it even to the interview, but uh, a yeah. friend of mine, made it all the way to they sent a list of 19 names to congress as a candidate class and they approved 16 of the names and she was one of the three names they did not oh that's rough oh, yeah no <laughs> that's rough but she came close that's she better than a lot of people close. um i already know well, one of the questions I have here is, do you have things like you do like to do your in your free time, they're extensions of what you do for your job. Now I have the example, I home brew. Oh. Um, but yeah, <laughs> beer and wine. So I know you want you do costuming. And I know that I so too, and that's a coming becoming a forgotten art. So mm -hmm. I kind of want to talk to you back to you about your costuming and what's been your favorite costume, and then we'll get on to if there anything else. Um yeah, that, that associated with your job, like like what I do does. Um, my my bachelor's is in chemistry, and I actually use that um, because uh, my daughter has an extremely restricted diet, a medically restricted diet, and um, so I have uh, had to be a mad scientist to to make things that she can eat, and um, so so that has. That has come in very handy. Um, straight. Um, transfer of skills from work to, to costuming. Um, there are some in, um, but they're more planning and um, outlining sorts of things, figuring out where the cutout points are and um, what the, you know, what the important portions are, what has to be done, what can, you know, what, what's your stretch goal and then what's your would be nice to have sorts of things. So it's, so it's more- Measure in millimeters, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but as far as my favorite costume, um, I have some that were, were very good in their day. Um, I've, I've kind of recently hit uh, a woman of a certain age, you know. Tell me so, about it. 
<laughs> yeah. So there's a bunch that I can't, uh, that I won't be wearing again, but I did Droxine from the Cloud Minders from the original Star Trek. Uh -huh. um, I have one specific Regency gown because I do Regency dancing and, and Victorian dancing. So I have a bunch of those costumes and there's one Regency gown that I really, I don't know what it is about it, but I, I adore that one. And uh, I, I always wanted a saloon hall girl costume and I didn't make it for many years. And when I finally made it, I was glad I had waited as long as I had because I had skills at that point that I would not have had earlier. And I, again, I was very, very happy with that costume and I wore it to death. <laughs> um, often the, the, either the one I just finished or the one I'm working on is my favorite, or it could be that it's my least favorite if it's being naughty. Um, but I've also found lately, especially since the pandemic, uh, the ones that I don't have to wear makeup for <laughs> are very much more popular. Um, so did you make the one you're wearing? I did. And that's uh, rough because that's that, is that faux leather or real leather? No, this is actually a leather coat that somebody gave me. Okay. It was, a, it was a full length coat and I took it off at the waist and I put it on a waistband and uh, it's, it's great because it's, it's old and it's damaged. So it's like authentic battle damage. Uh, and uh, it's great. so I had to put a zipper in it and I had to reline it and uh, all that. And then the pants are uh, Jodfers. Those are hard. <laughs> that lace Double up. buttons. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. If you don't sew, this woman is skilled. <laughs> <laughs> um, I bet you didn't expect you would be asked about that, but I saw them on your website and I had to ask. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to get into some science questions. Uh, we've been talking about, about black holes today with Dr. Uh, Thaler, and I'm just going to ask you, do you um, do we know what the role of uh, black holes are in the existence of the universe or uh, what their current theories are? You know, I haven't kept up on uh, black holes since, since college, so. Neither have I. I thought um, I'd ask them. <laughs> I was more of a chemist and a physical scientist than. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can relate to it. How about? Do you want to tell us some stuff about Mars? That's like the latest stuff because I know we, we know how much you're interested in Mars, so that would be great. Um, yeah, what's the what's the really f fun things we may not know about it? Well, if you haven't seen the videos of the uh, the helicopter, Google them because they're just amazing. And I have to say. I get goosebumps when they when I listen to the um, they have a, a microphone on uh, perseverance and you can hear the wind you can hear the the wheels creaking as the rover goes along and wow. they have one where you can hear the helicopter and I just get chills <laughs> when I when I hear those. Um, I just came off working on InSight, which is a uh, seismographic spacecraft uh, lander on Mars. And uh, uh, it recently recorded the highest uh, Mars quake, the biggest Mars quake that's ever been recorded. So, uh, so that was really exciting because we're, we're on the, our last legs on InSight, it was originally, I think a year, year and a half planned and we're two and a half years in and the solar panels are covered with dust and uh, we're, we're running out of power. And uh, so it's, uh, to, to have gotten that measurement, to have stayed alive long enough to get that measurement was, was very exciting. Do you know when, they, know when those panels start being covered up, the unit becomes dead, right? It's like a dead weight, like trash on Mars. Yeah, is there anything <laughs> we can do to to clean it up or like send some other one to clean it? Or <laughs> Well, you know, that's very interesting. Um, they've actually uh, spent the last nine months trying some really off the wall things to try to get to clear off some of the uh, some of the solar panels. And some of them have worked. I, I was frankly amazed. 
Uh, one of the things they're doing is they're waiting for the windiest part of the day and they're dropping dirt on the middle of the spacecraft, <laughs> hoping that some of it will blow onto the solar panels and some of the larger pieces will then slide across the solar panels and clear off trails on the on them and allow more power. Oh, and wow. it's like, I, I really think that that whoever thought that one up was sitting around drinking a beer and saying, <laughs> what the hell? What could you do? The next time idea. they need to put a squeegee on those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've been to, like a been, little, you know, we're we taking a lot of fact you could find something to pre to pressurize a small tank. I mean, it would take a while on Mars to blow, use it like a blower for your computer. <laughs> well, actually, um, uh, Perseverance yeah. does have a, a way to, to give a puff of, uh, of atmosphere to, to blow things off. But Perseverance is nuclear powered, so they don't, you know. They're very close to us, though. So we, we were joking that we should send the uh, the helicopter over and get it to buzz the solar panels. To, to <laughs> you could. That actually would be a good idea. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Uh, what's the next big thing coming up on Mars? Uh, the next mission uh, that hasn't launched yet and hasn't even really um, finished being designed yet is the sample return mission. Ah, uh, so, yeah, I've heard about that. Perseverance is caching samples. Um, they're they're putting them in a tube and and then leaving them several tubes in a in a spot that then can be taken and taken back to Earth. Um, so so that will be the next really big thing on Mars. They're not going anywhere. When do you yeah. think that's going to happen? <laughs> uh, I honestly don't remember when that is slated to happen. Um, what are, um, what are some of the main hur hurdles that have to be overcome, um, with that particular project? With the uh, sample return? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how you would, I mean, I'm thinking like space shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, is it lift off, for example, can they lift off Mars safely or is that a problem? Cause I heard that landings are really hard on Mars. So um, is that is that right or not? Or am, am no, I confused? No, not really. Um, we um, we've uh, kind of between the uh, the airbag bouncers and the uh, sky crane, um, we have several different systems um, depending on the weight of the lander. Um, but uh, the the difficult part is going to be collecting those. And putting them in something that then has to be blasted off into space. If you watched or read The Martian, um, with people, they did it in stages where they sent the, the uh, plant to build the fuel and the return vehicle before they sent anything else. And then they started sending, you know, building materials and food and, and what have you. And then they finally sent the astronauts. And um, so, Trying, I mean, it obviously is a lot easier with much smaller and non-living uh, payload, but it's still a very complex thing. First of all, to get there, to find the caches, to put them in the return vehicle and to launch the return vehicle. Um, and, you know, there's been, there's still being some trade-offs of is there one return vehicle? Is there several return vehicles? Are they going to go fetch it with a rover? You know, are we going to have several rovers to go and get them and bring them back? Or is one big rover going to go and collect them all? Uh, there's been a lot of uh, back and forth and a lot of ideas. This is this is where that that sense of wonder comes in. That 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 out of the box thinking is well, let's give this a whirl. <laughs> you know, yeah. let's try this. Let's let's make a a, a prototype of this and see how that works. Let's make a big caches, bouncy ball. <laughs> yeah. Do those caches have homing signals so they can find them? I don't think so. Because they, I mean, there is enough wind or they could get buried. That's all I'm thinking about. Um, one of the things we do is um, we keep real good tabs on the rovers with um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. 
it has a very, very high resolution camera on it. And mm -hmm. so um, we use that for uh, picking landings or helping to, uh, to characterize landings, possible landing sites. Um, and I imagine that the same sort of image tracking will be used to guide the uh, return vehicle to where the, those caches are. Um, once, uh, once Perseverance drops them off, I'm sure that MRO is going to say, you know, is going to take a picture of where they are when they're dropping it off. And then that gives them a lot of triangulation to get the other rover or whatever is going to go pick them up. Maybe it'll be people. <laughs> how long, how close do you think it, re I mean, that might actually be easier to getting people on Mars. Um. I, it, it, at that point, why would you go and, and collect samples when you can just collect them yourself? Well, that's true, but I'm but at least we would traipse along and, and pick them up. <laughs> pick up our <laughs> take the sand our litter. out of the way. <laughs> pick our litter up, clean up after ourselves. Yeah, get rid of the earth trash. <laughs> leave um, nothing, how, take nothing but photographs, leave nothing but footprints. There you go. So do you think we're within 10 years of putting people on Mars or do you think it's going to be longer than that? I think it's going to be longer than that. Um, I, I worry that we're going to do Mars the way we did the moon. And that is we're going to go and we're going to make a big deal out of it and plant a flag and never go back. And I really, I would dearly love, it would be so amazing to be alive when we land humans on Mars, but I would be willing to trade that for doing it right, to doing, doing it sustainably and as a, a part of a progression rather than a one and done. Yeah, it would have been nice to uh, put a living space on the moon and have that, the next stage of that. Um, I kind of wonder if uh, some of the private companies might pay, pay to explore Mars. I don't know if there would be enough money in it or not. Of course, they could set the tourist trade. <laughs> That's a heck you know, of a long trip, though. It's We don't even have space tourism really yet. Um, so, And the, the difficulties with going to Mars are so much larger. Um, you know, people in... Uh, make the analogy of the old, you know, crossing the ocean in sailing ships, but it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. And um, I don't know that we have solved those problems yet. Um, I, I worry much. about, in the early days of uh, airplanes, um, there were people who were doing it right. And there were people who were just saying, cool, let's do this. And then they would kill themselves and they'd kill people on the ground. And, and, Planes got an, uh, a reputation for being very dangerous. Space is very dangerous. And I'm concerned that if private enterprise does it, they will cut corners because that's what they do. They want to make a profit. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that this is not the right venue for that. <clears throat> Once you have explored it and found the, the traps and identified the the things and develop some technology, then that's when the commercial missions can come in and do what they do best, which is being more efficient and cutting corners and, uh, you know, marketing it to the right people and whatever. There are, that is a place for it, but I don't think the first people on Mars should be a, a, a private mission. I think that would be reckless and dangerous and not only that and this is this is the scientist in me if they screw up they have contaminated a planet and we lose the possibility of finding out if there ever was life on mars um if there was is it the same as earth life did they come from the same source i mean there's a whole raft of questions which if they do it wrong we cannot answer and so I, I'm, I would be very concerned if that's the way it went.
Well, that's a fascinating thought because it's true. If they die there and their remains or whatever microbes spread around, then we can't be sure if those are Martian or, you know, earth earthbound <laughs> creatures. So that's that that's how they would do it. I hadn't even thought about that. That was a really good answer. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and I and uh, Terry Sears has a question, and this kind of I haven't seen this picture, but she said, "What do you think about the image of Mars? What that looks like a doorway into the side of a hill? Was it a photo aberration or was it Photoshop?" <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that one either. I haven't seen that. I, one. I haven't seen it either. It's really cool. I have to say, it's really cool. Um, I I really don't think it's either. Um, I have seen. Uh, geology formations that do that same sort of thing. It's, um, you can see that the terrain is layered. You can see that there's fraction, fractionation in the, in the rocks. Um, Mars is very hot, well, not very hot, but it's hotter during the day and much colder at night. And so you get this thawing and, and freezing cycle. And so you do get fracturing, fractioning, fracturing, here we go, of, of rocks just by that heating cycle. And uh, where we are used to have um, water in it. So there are probably veins in between some of the layers with crystals, salt crystals or what have you. So that's gonna change, that's gonna be like a wedge to break the rocks. So the fact that there's a block down the, the, the slope that looks just like the hole seems to indicate that something happened and it tumbled out. I've seen that sort of thing in, you know, in the desert before. And it's kind of cool that it looks like a, you know, a cave, but you know, it's just like the 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 face on Mars, if you remember that. That it, it yes, I was I was thinking a, about that one. <laughs> So there's no hobbits living on Mars. Sadly, no. Well, they left the door open. You know. Yeah, there you go. Um, Carrie wanted to know. Um, you were talking about how to spot the caches um, that are put out with all the soil and rock samples. Is there a GPS system for Mars? It sound, kind of sound like what you were talking about. Um, it's not a GPS system in that they're not a, a, a whole network of satellites. There are quite a few satellites there, um, but we would be relying mostly on the images from uh, the high-res camera on uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, not, uh, although I do like the idea of having a, 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 a beeper of some sort or a flasher on them, but I, I, that isn't, it's a little late for that since we've already <laughs> landed and be started building our cache, so. Tell me about the poster behind you, uh, Amazing Saturn. You left that out on purpose, didn't you? I did. So, um, uh, I don't know exactly how they did it, but they, they got, um, the, there actually are staff artists at the lab. And uh, one of the things they did during the Cassini mission was to do uh, magazine covers, like, like Pulp Fiction magazine covers. It looks like yeah. one. Um, with uh, pictures from, or artists' interpretations of the Cassini mission. So this is the, the Cassini spacecraft, and this is the Titan lander. Uh, that was done by, by ESA. And uh, so, and that is kind of what you would see from the surface of Titan uh, looking up at Saturn. Of course, yeah. you're frying your eyeballs. But, and you've got, well, and you've got frozen oxygen, snow. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's actually uh, hydrocarbons. This is all. This oh, it's is, hydrocarbons. Yeah. Hydrocarbons. It's still cold. <laughs> You know, here, here's a weird question. When the lander kept going through the layers of atmosphere and Saturn and they finally lost the signal, remember that whole thing where it stopped transmitting, where, where did it end up? Do we know if there's a core, if there's a solid core or did it just shatter into- For Saturn? Know? Well, no, no, when I'm thinking Cassini, when, remember the Cassini, wasn't that, that 
yeah, didn't it just fall down and disappear? Yeah, we we, uh, we went in, into the atmosphere and. Um, yeah, because it what, was there the signal lost and that's it and you don't yeah. know or in the, we just well, have no idea. There really isn't a solid core to to Saturn. Right, that that's what I was thinking. Um, but Cassini melted. <laughs> okay. is the easiest way to say it. Right. it uh, between the, the the friction of the passage and the uh, high temperature in the lower layers and the ripping apart from the crosscut winds. Uh, it, it, there was no chance of it landing anyway. I mean, it's not a lander, but right, it right. really isn't a solid surface. There has been speculation on whether there's kind of a liquid surface, but you know, the pressure gets so high. You know, what's a liquid? What's a plasma? What's a solid? It's uh, you're, so it's melted. That, that's curious. Yeah, I was just always wondering because they said it disappeared and like, well. Did it just, you know, what fracture or what? So yeah, if it's melted, that's interesting. Yeah, it pretty Thank much you <laughs> for answering that. Wow. Fascinating. I'm looking for more questions. So I have another one for you. Can, can, I kind of gather um, you're the Mars person, but can you tell us there's a lot of stuff going on. What are you most excited about? I'm anxious to see what uh, Europa Clipper does. Uh, they're going to Europa, and uh, I think they're just an orbiter. I don't think they have a lander, but it should uh, give us some incredible images of Europa, and that could be that could be game changing for us in in terms of what we understand about those moons. Yeah. What do you think oh, they'll find? I'm sorry. I said, what do you think they'll find? Uh, you know, what's what's everybody? I haven't liquid looked at water in maybe? a long time. Yeah. Yes, we be we believe there's liquid water there, uh, but it's below a ice crust, so I don't know that we will actually see it. I'm not as familiar with the instruments, so I don't know what specifics we would look for but i guarantee we'll find out things that we didn't expect <laughs> hey i have a, another question from somebody what would you tell girls to study in school if they want to be involved in space related fields that's an interesting question one thing is whatever it is they should really enjoy it because you're going to be doing it a lot <laughs> yep <laughs> um, but uh, pretty much anything in the sciences has a, tr a way to transition over. As I said, my, my degrees are in uh, chemistry and planetary science. So the fact that I'm actually working more as an engineer is, is kind of how things end up. But having that science background allows me to understand things in a different way than somebody who came up through a straight engineering background would. Mm -hmm. Now, I fully admit that I can't build a spacecraft. And if that's where you, where you want to do, then engineering is definitely the way you want to go. But if you want to do the operations, anything in science would be, would be an added advantage. And take a few engineering courses too, so that you can, so that you're bilingual. You can speak to scientists and engineers. I had the engineers in my chemistry classes. <laughs> <laughs> they see, see things so much differently. They um, do. Two friends of mine, one is an, an engineer and one is a scientist, and they're both hysterically funny. And they do a panel at cons where they, they do this compare and contrast between scientists and engineers. And it's, it really is a natural antipathy because the scientists are saying, hey, let's go and do this. And it's like, and the engineers are going, do you understand that it's going to break the spacecraft? And it's like, well, what, what are we out of here for if we're not taking the measurements? Well, if you break it, then you're not going to be out there and getting any more data. And 
it's there's a natural antipathy there that that my brother's a chemi and when he did his masters i said where are you getting your data well it's on the web uh, you know it's in the literature i said you have to have your own data you can't take other people's data <laughs> I once, uh, my, my thesis advisor gave us a, a seminar and he was considered the chemist of the group. And he gave this whole seminar on the, the photochemistry of Venus's atmosphere. And he gets to the end and he says, the bad thing about this model is that it violates thermodynamics, but we feel this is a small problem. And I just <laughs> fell off my chair and everybody else is going, oh, yeah. <laughs> because everybody else was a theoretician too. And it's like, yeah. I heard <laughs> Isaac real. I heard our Isaac Asimov's defense was on a totally fictional project. So that's kind of the, in the same job. <laughs> what else? Uh, let's see. Shelly's dad wants to ask, what do you hope to find or determine about the universe before you leave this planet behind someday? Well, probably mm. with not without rocket fuel. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I have to say, the one thing I would like to find is life elsewhere. And even if we never, if we, if, if I'm not around when we figure out whether it all came from one spot or it developed par in parallel, it would be a comfort to me to know that we are not alone. We're not, we're not alone. I know that. We got too many planets out there that are habitable. Plus, we got those UFOs, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> because hey, you know this the, the Senate hearing. Remember that we just had one in this yeah. week. Or yeah. So hey, we never know. Never know. Uh, well, maybe, Dr. Maybe Landry, we do know. <laughs> any is there something you'd like to share with us? I mean, I'm just waiting to see if anybody has any more questions um of what's coming up for you or i'm just gonna um, leave it open-ended i i did have a few stories i wanted to tell all right do it okay <laughs> um one of the things about working on mars is that um, a martian day is 40 minutes longer than an earth day and so you either have to lose out on time or you have to go on to living on Mars time. And that is the same as being permanently jet lagged because your body can adapt to one hour a day of time change. But if you're moving 40 minutes a day, you never catch up. Oh my Lord, I need to go to Mars. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's extremely disorienting after a while. And when we were on Pathfinder, um, I talked to people who were on Viking and they didn't, they didn't do Mars time. They did kind of a long days where the, the Martian day moved within the, the you know, they, they, they do a 12 hour shift and the Martian daytime would move, you know, one day it was here and the next day it was here and the next day it was here. So they, they were on the same schedule, but the, the Martian portion was, was changing. Pathfinder, we actually changed our clocks and moved to, to Mars time. So we were up when it was dark on Mars because we were planning the next day's activities. And when we were testing this in advance, we did it for a week and, and it was okay. You know, it's like, okay, we can do this. The problem is a week isn't very long and you can do anything for a week because, you know, we've all been finals week, you know, you don't sleep. Okay, fine. You know, you, you, you get used to that. You do a five day world con, you don't sleep. Okay, fine. You find ways to deal with it. But long about Saul number 13 or 14, where you're really wrapped around the clock it gets really weird. Now, I have to say, I, I never was one to do mind altering substances, but I imagine that's kind of what it was like. And 
and it's it's <laughs> it's indescribable sometimes. So some of the stories that people told about what happened to them when they were on Mars time, this is this is back in the 90s. So I tried to date a check. I was writing a check in the grocery store and I tried to date it the Sol number. That is the day on Mars. As opposed to the day on Mars. <laughs> and more than once I walked out of the building and, and was very startled that the sun was up <laughs> because I had that lost, completely lost track of time. That scene in Apollo 13 where all these guys are laying on the floor sleeping and somebody comes through and the, somebody says, what time is it? Four? Is that a.m. or p.m.? Very, very a.m. I totally relate to that because it just, and there were times where I had to sleep in my office for an hour or two because I was not safe to drive home. And the worst one was a day I laid in bed for eight hours staring at the ceiling at just about when I fell asleep, the alarm went off and I had to get up. And just at that moment, they called and said, spacecraft reset last night. We're going to make, we're going to go ahead and take all this stuff we were going to send that we sent yesterday, send it again. So you don't have to come in. And it's like, oh, thank God. Uh, and sleep. <laughs> I was just, oh, I, I, I wouldn't have been safe to drive. It was just a nightmare. And the one I like best is somebody else um, had been working on Mars time. This is somebody who worked, worked on Mer. And he was, he, was, he got out, he got in his car and he drove all the way across town, he, you know, an hour and a half from work pulled up in front of his house. And that's when he remembered that he had moved to Pasadena the year before. He was at his old house. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I take it they're not doing that anymore. Um, they do, but they do it for shorter periods of time. And they have learned a lot about how to deal with it. Now I have to say that I did, I actually dealt with Mars time better than some because I was used to going to science fiction conventions. And I know <laughs> that if you don't sleep, you have to eat. And um, I also know when I'm tired and when I'm don't do anything, even cross the road tired. You get to know that difference. And uh, so I actually was able to, to tolerate it a little longer than some people. Take me, oh, send oh, me. <laughs> you know, I keep on saying it because I I have the weirdest hour. So it's like, yep, I'm on I'm on Mars time. Take me. <laughs> All that training. Tell us another story. We still have a little bit of time. I've got a story about um, one time I met uh, Robert Heinlein. I was at a con, oh. and. Uh, I didn't actually meet him. He, I was I was in the room while he was being interviewed, and uh, this woman who was interviewing had absolutely no idea who he was or what science fiction is about. Wow! Totally, totally clueless. And so she's she 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 says to him. Do you really think that anybody would be interested in going into space? <laughs> and he just he just kind of looks at her and he says, you know, I can walk out of this door right now and say, I'm providing one-way tickets to Alpha Centauri. And there would be a line 50 people long. And I picked up my backpack and said, I've got my toothbrush, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> And she just kind of looked at me and she looked at him and she looked at the rest of the people in the room. And they're all clear. totally non comprehension. And the, the man came up with stuff like cell phones. One of his kids, one of his kids book, he talks about the kid reaching into his pocket to talk to his parent on the cell phone. I, well, I wouldn't call that. But yeah. I thought, yeah, I mean, he was amazing. Mm -hmm. Waterbeds. Tell me some more. What else? <laughs> uh, oh, I got a story from somebody else. Uh, 
again, about this staying up late. Uh, a friend of mine was not a big coffee drinker, but you know, she was, she was working a, a maneuver in the middle of the night. So this is on Cassini. And uh, so she was, something happened. And instead of being able to go home afterwards, she had to stick around and, and try to, uh, try to solve the problem. And people started coming in in the morning and uh, they noticed that she was just kind of vibrating. And somebody said, Kim, are you okay? She says, yeah, 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 I am. And they said, how much coffee have you had? <laughs> she said, two pots. <laughs> oh my Lord. <laughs> so. Here, you got oh, any questions, more questions? Oh, sorry, go ahead. One more, P pumpkin okay. carving cool. content. Pumpkin, pumpkin carving is a serious business at JPF. It is over the top. I cannot even tell you. And uh, Cassini was, had our own <laughs> pumpkin carving contest. And one of the teams was, shall we say, very involved in it. And the one I remember the most was they made a floor display with the little mini pumpkins as rocks and a lake of what was supposed to be methane and ethane, which was in <laughs> fact a combination of caro syrup and something else to get the right color and, and look. So, and the thing was like four feet by three feet and several inches deep with this sticky stuff. And they had carved rocks to look like the surface of Titan. And it was just, ah, it was amazing. But afterwards they, they dumped it in the dumpster. And one of the people who was on the team was leaving and she was in kind of a hurry because she had to go pick up her son. And she noticed as people gathered around the garbage, the, uh, the, the dumpster that they put stuff in and they're looking at the ground and something's leaking out at the bottom. And she listens and they're calling uh -huh. facilities and hazmat and <laughs> all, of, and it's like, and she's really got to go. And it's like, I can't let this go. I've got to tell them what it is. <laughs> and so she got stuck there for 45 minutes, explaining to hazmat, explaining to security, explaining to materials, explaining to <laughs> Probably better if they flush it down the sink. Yeah. And it's just caro syrup or something. It <laughs> wouldn't hurt anything. Or put it in your mouth. There you go. Lick it. <laughs> yeah. Ew. Ew. <laughs> Anyone else? Did we have something in the chat? Some question? I thought something. I think that. I got all of them, but yeah, let me I look. Think, I think they've all been asked. I think everything in the chat has been asked. I can't make it go up. No, it just wants to sit there. You know how it is. You, you're trying to roll up and down. The, it, it just sits there. <laughs> well, we appreciate it a lot. I'm, this is kind of a going, going, gone. Anybody else got a question? If you, I, I, I have a brief question, but if you hadn't gotten so involved in Mars, because most of your projects have been on Mars, is there another area that you would have wanted to pursue? That's a tough question because I... I imprinted on Mars really early. I mean, uh, I followed the, the Viking mission obsessively and I was, you know, I read Pod King of Mars. I read all of the, the mission, you know, the books about, about civilizations on Mars and what have you. And I just, it's always been my favorite. And uh, we, and apparently my mother used to uh, be a Girl Scout leader and uh, she once scared all the girls in her troop at a, a camp out by pretending to be an alien. And uh, so, <laughs> so the joke was then always that my mother was from Mars. And so I always said, well, you know, I'm half Martian. I got to work on Mars. That's, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> What, what do you think of the theory of Mars having been a green planet long, you know, billions of years ago, and then something happened to wipe it off and it lost all the 
what is it, the magnetic field was gone and um, then the atmosphere evaporated. So it became this, this iodized rock or whatever. How, do, how would that have happened? I mean, what, what would have caused that kind of thing? Just um, any ideas, <laughs> any real ideas, not just like, you know. <laughs> Uh, real ideas. Um, we know that there was water on the surface. We, we have find evidence of it all over. Um, we can tell by the isotopic ratios of the water that we do see that the water that that most of the water it had to start with is still there. It's it's underground somewhere. That's why we keep looking for it because we have indicators that that there was once a lot of water and that it has not been evaporated because, uh, or, or it had not left the planet because that would enrich what was left in deuterium and we don't see that. So um, with that much water, anywhere, anywhere on earth that you find water, you find life. And so the chances that there is that there was life on Mars at some point, it seems very likely. We have yet to determine that. We, we don't see you know, peat bogs or remnants of it. We haven't seen any of that. But then again, where we land, maybe we wouldn't. You know, we, we're trying, it's a, it's a trade-off. The places where, that are more interesting are really hard to land in. And the places that we can land, is interesting sometimes. That's one of the advantages of having a rover is that you can go from where it was okay to land and go to some of this more interesting terrain. So I think that we will find eventually that there was life there, but we we haven't been able to, to prove it yet. This may be a dumb question. I know. The one that's not asked, right? right. Um, <laughs> You said isotopic ratios. Are those from like uh, spectra from the planet, or where are you getting where are you getting the isotopic ratios? Um, we can see it from uh, some of the uh, subsurface uh, uh, measurements from um, Odyssey and MRO. Have um, actually we've seen it because we can see what's in the atmosphere and what's in mm -hmm. the and so there is water in the atmosphere, and by measuring that, we can tell what the that the the ratios of deuterium to hydrogen in the water that we see are what we would expect if it had not lost a large percentage of its water. I know they have uh, and I don't this is not my field but I know that um we have water scientists that estimate the age of water in the ac deep aquifers by look I think looking at the amount of deuterated and water and tr and tr the H3, tritium-based mm -hmm. water. Um, I, probably no possibility of that doing that from the atmosphere, but that would be really cool to find out how long that water has been on there. Yeah, yeah. It would. I keep on seeing these stories about water, like all of our water being from the outer solar system that places like Titan, you know, all that, all those outer planets, the gas giants are really the source of our water. H how much is that like a thing? <laughs> is, is it possible that they, they, they kind of, the, the comets brought it here into it, the inner system and, you know, Earth got some, Mars got some, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, we, we can see that because of, um, on the moon where, and, and Vesta too, well, no, not Vesta. Uh, on the moon, uh, the, where we have seen impacts that we see, we see water more towards those impacts so, so that it seems to indicate that it came in that way. And so it's logical to assume that that's where ours came from as well. That's a lot so of comments. Questions okay. can come in and they're, they're yep. related, it looks like. So I'm yeah, to somebody asked if you like Edgar I, uh, Bryce Bureau's Princess of Mars series. It sounds like you did. <laughs> You've read I, those. I did read them, but I read them very late. Um, I don't remember why I didn't read them earlier, but um, I think I read them uh, before John Carter, the movie came out because I wanted to have the context. I still haven't read them. I, I've started, but I haven't made it through. There, Somebody else, 
Yes, somebody else said, does working on Mars missions take away from reading such novels and other sci-fi like Potty Cane of Mars? I, I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna let you answer it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It doesn't, partially because I'm a nerd and I'd like to say, see, they got that wrong. <laughs> but um, I have to tell you that we, there were six or seven of us that went together to see The Martian when oh, it came out. Even though it was and <laughs> a bunch of us had read the book so we you know we knew it was coming and it was really funny because each one of us was annoyed about something different that was more their specialty issue <laughs> I, I was sitting next to my friend kim who who was on the rover teams and she just went ape shit about that there are no lights on the rover because we do not drive the rover at night and, you know and that was the, the one thing that we all laughed at though was that really high tech and beautiful uh entrance way to jpl because yeah that's not it we just fell out of our chairs at that point <laughs> somebody said that the wind there wouldn't be enough wind to cause some of the damage they got because the atmosphere is so thin that's one of the ones i heard somebody complaining about well he actually made that choice um to and later in the, the book he actually addresses just storms correctly but he, mm -hmm. he wanted to have a way to strand him there that wasn't anybody's fault. Right. So he made the choice to say, okay, this is not how the, mar the dust storms go, but we're gonna- Like a freak, freak dust storm or a freak accident maybe. <laughs> yeah, he, he wanted some way to make him be left behind that wasn't anybody being stupid or not following procedure or whatever. So I'll, I'll give him that. It was a wonderful book. I, I particularly liked the stuff they didn't cover where he figured out using the solar panels where he was relative to the, I mean, that's like, really? You had to leave that out? <laughs> I know, I know. No, I I have to tell you, when, when he's going through and he goes to get Pathfinder, I was just like, oh my God! <laughs> because Pathfinder doesn't get mentioned a lot. And so to, to have it be in the Martian, it was like, that was that was pretty cool. Well, I'm going to close this up. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. really been a pleasure to get you, to know you a Thank little you. bit. I'm I sorry I don't know about black holes and I asked the wrong question, but learned a lot of stuff about NASA and JPL <laughs> and everything and about Mars. Yes, um, please come back next year and tell us more. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. And and I'm going to do the PSA and and tell everybody. Um, up next, you go to Discord to link into the next session. It's Green Trivia Games of the Atlantis Grail. It starts <laughs> at 7.30 p.m. So the link will not work until about 7.25. But it's next to last chance to get into the finals. <laughs> okay, thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks Bye -bye. for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You need to give give me let me give me back uh, being host you so just I can and okay in the recording that's all I need you to do if you can do that in the recording we're good. Uh, let me see. I think I have that choice. Yeah, stop recording. Okay. All right. I'm gonna end this.